Welcome back to the YouTube home for BamaOnline.com. Travis Ryer, Senior Analyst for BOL alongside site publisher Tim Watts. It is a Thursday. It is March the 14th. Tim Watts, it is spring. I've got on my Sawgrass golf shirt. Checked out the Alabama men's golf team, as only I would over the last weekend out there at Sawgrass. You got on your Atlanta Braves uh, regalia. You're ready. Yeah, spring, I'm ready. Season. I'm ready. So I feel like. We got daylight savings time. I mean, it's here, Tim. It's, it's don't all start with me on the Don't start with me on the daylight savings time. That's do not other your jam. Do other countries have this? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm I mean, aware of. I don't, I just don't know. I just feel like we either got, I mean, I feel like we were doing fine at one point. What's up, Tex Titer? Tex Titer checking in. Keith, Keith Greiner. Another regular. Checking in. Yes. Here for the tip off. Appreciate it, fellas. Uh, it is spring, but we've got, it seems like, Tim, we got sports of every season we to do. talk about. We've got football to talk about. We've got football recruiting to talk about. We've got hoops to talk about with Nate Oates' team headed up to Nashville with a potential rubber match against those Florida Gators, assuming the Gators take care of business against the Georgia Bulldogs in a second-round matchup today. Uh, you'd have Alabama-Florida late night on Friday from up in Nash Vegas. So no shortage of topics. Of course, we've got that, that BOL roundtable mailbag that just continues to kill it as well. We love it. Yeah, they do a great job there. And I looked it up, about 33 to 40% of all the world uses daylight saving time. Okay. And it was interesting. On the side note, Germany started using it during World War I or World War II. So found that odd. found that interesting. They wanted that extra time extra hour so that it saves energy well i mean where What's else up, are you going to get that kind of information than right here on t watts and tr tim i will mm -hmm. lay on my deathbed with a bunch of really cool things to tell the nurses that absolutely doesn't matter yeah lisa checking in here in the comments yes other countries do have daylight savings time some have not started yet so it's the minority though yeah it's kind of like new year in some of those things, you know, different countries, it's the New Year's, different days. 70 countries total, 40% of those across the globe. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we've got, uh, we got to get into some things here on a Thursday morning, Tim, as we allow the viewers and listeners to uh, make their way into the program. As always, we appreciate you tuning in here to the YouTube channel for BamaOnline.com. If you would, please hit that like button. And also, if you haven't already, how about subscribing to the YouTube channel here for BOL? Turn on those notifications. You'll get all of our YouTube content as it drops. And of course, right there with us at BamaOnline.com. Spring break, Tim, but it doesn't really feel like it in some ways. You know, we say yeah. it's spring break, but we got Nick Saban up in Washington for crying out loud. Uh, that scene sort of brought to mind, was it Godfather 2? Yeah, it, has, was, it had that feel to it, didn't it? Absolutely. That's exactly what it was. It did have that feel. I mean, of course, the overreactions. I tell you what, I think a lot of people think it's free reign to come down on Nick Saban because he's an older white male. I think they just come down on him because we had coaches, Kirby, Dion, everybody else said the same thing, jackasses. They said the exact same thing. Nobody said, hey, I love this system. It's perfect. We're doing the best thing for these kids. Nobody said that. It doesn't matter if he said it from a from a his his tent at the KOA camp or the billion dollar mansion again in the Godfather where they found the horse head. It doesn't matter either he's right or he's wrong, but a lot of people are still mad about that committee vote. I think well, it left, I think it left a mark on him. I think it, well, think it hurt him. Well, and that PTSD just in general from the Nick Saban reign of terror. You know, so yeah. many people Tim thought he was gone. You know, as if he had passed away. Like. You never hear from or see Nick Saban again. And what this has reaffirmed, and I felt this way even last week after the ESPN story in which he talked about the decision process and what went into uh, his retirement, this guy still moves the needle unlike anyone in collegiate and athletics. That's, that's what I think bothered them. I think and they, if you they think he's gone – Wait till college football season rolls around. And I think they Nick ain't it, going anywhere. And I think they thought it was safe to yell at him yeah. because he is in his 70s. Get off my lawn. No, no, no. He was educating you. You should have said thank you. 
The other coaches are saying the exact same thing. Nobody in their right mind would say this is a perfect product right now and doesn't need improving. That was what it was. I think I think that the outrage of him speaking is absurd. It's absurd to get on your Twitter account and go, he shouldn't speak. Well, I, I think there is a good it's bit ridiculous. of posturing anytime you have a situation like that. Obviously, politics plays a role in it. If you're Ted Cruz, that's a nice W for you to be able to escort or to present Nick Saban in a fashion like he did. So there's some other aspects to this that I don't really care that much about or yeah. don't want to get into really. Uh, but here's the thing about Nick Saban. He wasn't just saying these things after he retired. He was saying these things for the last few years while his yeah. team was very much relevant to the college football playoff and national championship contention. I'll tell you who else probably likes what Nick Saban's selling right now is the non-revenue sports because the viability of athletic departments as a whole, as they are constructed right now, Tim, we've heard from Greg Byrne, we've heard from Nick Saban. Look, no one's going to feel bad for Alabama athletics uh, or the University of Alabama's um, financial situation. They're in great shape. But the reality is, they're not necessarily in the black when you take everything into consideration. And I will say this too for Nick Saban and Alabama as an athletic department. What people never talk about is the reinvestment that UA continues to make in relation to facilities. You know, they're not eating out of an elementary school lunchroom over there off Bryant Drive. If you've seen the new nutrition center, if you've seen the new sports science center, uh, as far as putting back into the athletes and providing care and quality of life that exceeds just about anyone else you know, uh, that's what I know the University of Alabama has done. There was just a lot of agendas with the opinions. It wasn't whether or not what Nick Saban said was right. It was the outrage that Nick Saban said it. And again, Kirby Smart said the same thing. And he's, what is he, 49 years old? He's 20-something years younger Definitely a different ger generation. He said the same thing. Dion echoed those sentiments. College coaches I talked to, NFL coaches I talked to, all agree this is a mess. They need some help. This is not necessarily what's best. Nobody's saying don't pay the kids. Nobody's railing against the kids getting compensation. I haven't seen anybody anyways. I know Nick Saban wasn't. But, I mean, that was kind of the message. You know, you get whatever Twitter allows you character-wise to give your opinion. And a lot of it just spent on, you know, Nick Saban. Did he say that from his boathouse or his penthouse? Well, That's with a lot of folks, take. Nick original Saban take. can say, you know, water's wet. No, it's not. That's just that's just Nick Saban's for you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he, he can make the most he hurt, benign statements this. and it's going to attract. The one thing uh, he attention. did was he hurt a lot of feelings in the media. A lot of these media guys, they are they are in their feelings. They are really hurt. The old journalist and all that, they are a lot of these guys are emotionally involved in in what he has to say. I found it kind of crazy. And again, it was a shame that like other coaches, like nobody really talked about Kirby Smart, who I think's kind of moving to that next generation voice of college coaches, right? I mean, who else you listen to if you're not listening to Kirby right now? He echoed the same things. And that was just a blip. I accidentally found that in a link to a story about Nick Saban. I found Kirby's comments. That's crazy. He didn't get more run right now. It's got to be frustrating, oh, too. I didn't even see Dion in the news. It just speaks to, again, the needle mover in college football is still Nick Saban. And if wow. I'm ESPN, I'm loving this right now because you know who's got Nick Saban next? ESPN. And you know what ESPN's going to find out? Similar to what Alabama discovered? Whatever ESPN is paying Nick Saban, Tim, is a bargain because between aggregators, uh, you know, quotes that he's going to have, anything he says is going to be repurposed. Points. Yes, it's going to be yes. uh, reheadlined, and it is going to pop for the foreseeable I mean, future. We had a 72-year-old man say college football now – Needs help. Doesn't resemble what I grew up coaching college football. And they were like, holy crap, what a hot take. Kirby Smart will say that. Dabo Sweeney's saying, Ben's screaming that. 
All these guys are saying the same thing. It doesn't matter how old he is or the experience. I think they're mad. He, they still feel that he's going to influence some power over them because they've got 50,000 Twitter followers. So they're all going to get upset about it. But yeah, he's got more power than you. That's why he's got the big houses you're talking about. It's ridiculous. The point was lost by a lot of people, which sucked because it was good discussion. It is more about, you know, it is more about, I mean, you can't just hand every 17 year old $150,000, $200,000. You got to help them. I don't even know how to, it took me years to figure out how to, to, to manage my money correctly. I had to get, have kids to do it. So well, I, mean, maybe, I, I guess what's, if, if a lot of what we're hearing is true, maybe the more concerning part is the folks that either parent or guide or mentor, however it goes, a lot of these young people, if we're to take Nick Saban's comments for what they are, and maybe you see this or hear this and uh, your, all of your work on the recruiting trail and how it's evolved, is that personal and athletic growth is way down the list these days, or at least it's get a bag, big, 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 big space, or three or four spaces, then personal and athletic development. Yeah, there's the maturity process that goes. You know, you remember when you were 20 and you wanted that Corvette? Well, there's a reason most 20-year-olds don't have a Corvette because they would wrap them religiously around telephone poles. That and I was broke as a joke. But yeah. that that's that, but that goes <laughs> hand in hand, right? Yeah. You didn't have the money, you know, because I mean you've seen that, you know, the young child stars are probably knew somebody that had that access and ended up in trouble. There's a process that goes with maturing, because you gotta remember at 18, you still you never even Mortality doesn't cross your mind, right? Tomorrow's rarely. I mean, there's Invincible. always gonna there's yeah. always gonna be exceptions to the rules. There's always gonna be guys, you know. I think I'll go back to Minka. There's always gonna, I don't think there's any era of football that would have affected Minka. You know what I mean? I just think Minka was Minka, and it's Minka's just the one, the the poster child for that for me, because there's a bunch of them like that we've seen at several different colleges, but um, I do think it could affect. I think it limits the growth of their potential of how hard they got to work. Because if you got to work really hard to make money, if you get the money before the work, how many people are still going to do, you know, how many people are, you know, going to do that? You know, probably the minority. And I'm not judging them. Adults would be the same way. That's why it's always a big story when the guy wins the lottery and goes back to work. And we're all like, what are you doing? Yeah. You know? Well, I, I look at it even with, with guys in the past before NIL and the money that's involved now. I think of a guy like Jadeveon Clowney, you know, coming out of high school, so talented, so gifted, didn't really matter if he went to Alabama or if he went oh, to South yeah. Carolina. He was right. playing in the National Football League in three yeah. years. Jadeveon mm -hmm. Clowney was playing in the NFL. So, you know, he could go pretty much – but I do wonder, had he gone to Alabama instead of South Carolina, not only – would he have still been a top two type pick, but would he have had maybe even a better career in the national football league? Yeah, it hadn't been a bad career for Jadeveon Clowney, but yeah. has it been what we thought it would be when he was clotheslining Michigan running backs in the outback bowl and, you know, those type of things. I'd, I'd argue it hasn't, but yeah, you go I mean, back we, were to that too. we were expecting Clowney to be Miles Garrett, right? Yeah. And take and take the Miles Garrett, you know, some of the stuff off the, you know, some it actually was on the field, but take that Steeler incident aside. He's been a pretty, you know, even in college, he was talking about writing poetry and doing mature stuff and, and stuff that kind of separated him from the crowd. Some people are just built different. You know, I like to work. I'm one of those guys. I mean, you got, I, I like to work. I like to do this podcast this morning, but don't have to do it. I like to get on here, chop it up with you, talk recruiting and chase the puzzle. Um, some people don't like work. My children, for one. No, they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's do because work. you do like work. That's yeah. that's usually that's usually how, there's a reason Paris Hilton's not a hard worker, you know, because dad dad did all the work for him. But I just collectively, I just want what's best for college football. I love it. I want what's best for these kids. I mean, it's hard coming from not a lot. And I grew up, I didn't have a lot, but it's hard coming from not a lot and then having a lot. You know what I mean? If your first purchase is a Hellcat, when you fall into some money, that's not, that's probably, you know, that's probably not the best direction to, to, to do future growth. My biggest concern, because I love sports, is that will all these guys still reach their potential? I'm glad they're yeah. getting compensation. I'm glad. I'm happy for them.
but I just worry that some it'll be enough. You know what I mean? Joe Hall checking in here in the comments, and we're going to get to our roundtable mailbag coming up a little bit later. Uh, he says, although Saban is right, will his comments hurt Tide recruiting? Uh, Tim, I guess the I don't. the inclination there being that Saban being pretty anti-NIL in its current state, and that is the sort of uh, delineation that needs to be made here. He's not anti revenue sharing or players sharing in the wealth that college football now brings with it. Uh, but in its current state, he's obviously not happy with it. And again, he's also, I think, at least secondarily thinking about non revenue sports. He's thinking about G5s, just the sport in general across the board. No. I mean, he was against it last year when they had a great class number two in the country. He had the same stance the year before when they signed possibly the best class in the history of football, 2023. Uh, I feel like the 2022 class was second. I don't remember if it was number one. I think Georgia was number one. So he's had three top two classes. Um, so and with the same sentiment, right? I mean, this didn't just – this. it might have came to a head – after the Michigan game, it might have came to a head, but these thoughts have been there, and he shared them, and he's not the only one that shared them the whole time. Also, he's not the head coach, so I don't think it really it really matters to the recruits as much because it'll be Kalen DeBoer and his, you know, his staff doing their thing. Yeah, it seemed like Saban was still working with a scale in which he was able to – and the potential for the big picture more in, ahead of NIL – but based on his comments after this latest season, sounds like NIL and, and those type of things may be at least caught up with the NFL big picture and uh, perhaps even took a small I was, lead. I was glad he said something because I think people will know. I mean, I think adults without agendas, decision makers will listen to him and appreciate his feedback. Um, I think it also frees up. Uh, it's almost like a whistleblower. You get one guy to, you know, you know, uncover something and all the other coaches who are thinking it right, they don't necessarily want to be the bad guy because if you're, you know, you know, just focus on the SEC, if you're Brian Kelly or Kirby Smart or Billy Napier, you don't want to be quoted as saying I'm against NIL. You know no. what I'm saying? You got to be really careful because you see how Nick Saban's words got twisted. So every coach, Dan Lanning, Lincoln Riley, coast to coast, up to Ryan Day, they don't necessarily want to talk about it because, again, an interview, when you take 140 of those words or whatever Twitter allows now, you can turn it into what you want. We saw that this Context week. is definitely lost. Yes. Well, you know what? Let me tell you, everybody watch this show ever, read. Quit skimming. That friggin' preview, that's like reading the book, the, the inside of the book sleeve instead of the book. We have, even on our own stories, we have people ask questions that's in the story. In the thread, they're and, and, and those are the type of things that kill these collectives, too. I mean, if you're yay Alabama and Nick Saban is yeah. essentially being uh, being uh, displayed in a light that's just anti-NIL, anti-players sharing in the revenue, which isn't the case, and then you're yay Alabama and you're trying to go to your money people and say, look, we need you to kick in and – Maybe some of those folks are of the belief that, well, Nick's not, he's not pro players sharing in this stuff when in actuality he is. That's when it impacts your collective uh, I mean, from a he negative said, standpoint. He said Bryce was the example nobody talked about. Bryce well, Bryce got, is what it was supposed to be. Bryce, right? Bryce went and got NIL deals because everybody's not a superstar. I know this is really hard. After he got to Alabama. Yes, parents are really hard to understand himself. it. Everybody's not going to be QB1 at Alabama or a major school. Everybody's not going to go first number one pick in the draft or first round picks. Everyone shouldn't have the same NIL deals. I mean, you look at hot Matthew McConaughey has how many commercials and how many does Ed Norton have? Ed Norton's a hell of an actor. You know, you just pick a red, pick a random guy out there and he probably has 20. I don't know about because I don't watch commercials, but y'all get my point. But my seriously is like, the people that sell, sell. That's just the way it is. The people that sell, sell. So, And that is what the NIL name, image, likeness. It was never paid for play. And if you're paying them to come there, it's 100% paid for play. 
Well, with this Tennessee and Virginia stuff now in the courts here recently, the doors have essentially been blown off. If you want to yeah. go out and sell NIL to recruits and use that as your way to land them on the recruiting trail, right now at least, uh, and that's, okay. hey, that's open that's, season. That's the world they made. I'm not judging Tennessee at all for giving no. a big deal to Nico. I mean, that's the world that we create. I still love Virginia tied theirself to the Nico <laughs> deal. I love like – Everybody's like Tennessee and Virginia. I was like, hold up. Who did Virginia get? Where, where the hell did Virginia get in this talk? I know who Nico is. I know who Tennessee is. How did Virginia get in here? I was waiting for They're Rhode Island. Basketball. Or, yeah. I was waiting for Rhode Island, like lacrosse to go. And us too. We're tired of it. Um, but yeah, I think they've created it. I don't think they really, you know, I think it was a, a, a good idea. I think the idea was in the right place. I just think execution, you know, is just is every bit as important as any idea, right? Oh, you know, I like a absolutely. car that ran on no gas that I never had to fill up, make it. But someone's going to have to actually build that thing. A lot of broke and, idea people. You ever yeah, notice well, there's that? A lot of, there's yeah. a lot. I call them A to B people. You know, plans A to Z. They're A to B. Like, hey, you know what y'all to do? Yeah. You know what y'all do? Y'all do that. Or you know what thing. I would do? Yeah. You know oh, what yeah. I would do? Well, the my yeah. favorite is, you know what you should do? That's the one I'm like, no, no, no. Why aren't you doing it? Especially when it involves money, right? Yes. I always hey, love yes. those folks. Yeah. Um, let's talk They're about this. Week. Since we're on the uh, sort of recruiting trail talk, sure. there almost seems to be this, this perception right now that it's surprising what we've seen of late from Alabama football under Kalen DeBoer with some burgeoning success out on the recruiting trail. Is it really a surprise, though, Tim, what we've seen I mean, here of late? I mean, I think it's a surprise in the effect to the effect that you we some you didn't know. You don't know what you don't know. So But should we have known? Should we have I known? I think you should have. I mean, if he moves to because, Alaska, are we gonna say, can he recruit in Alaska? Well, yeah. the thing that we've learned is that people that can recruit can recruit anywhere, right? People that can recruit can recruit anywhere. You know, the old school coaches called it Kenny Sing it. Well, this staff, one, has really good rep, you know, they have really good relationships, good people skills. And two, there's a lot of effort that goes into their recruiting. Again, 100 people coming through, and I don't know if it's 100, it could have been 80 or 120, but so many recruits coming through the first week of spring. Now, he could have literally shut the door, right? He could have shut the door, seen his team for the first time, but he didn't. He opened it to the media for one day. Very long, it's a very excitable day for the for the media that had a chance to cover it. He opened the door for the recruits coming in and there was foot traffic constantly. So if you're, if you're a good person and are good building relationships and have that effort. So no, to me, it's not surprising. I think it's surprising. I don't, you know, some, I think, you know, you got that guys that are half full there. When, when Kalen DeBoer was hired, the Bama fans said he's going to do great. And you got the guys that are half empty that said, I don't know if he's going to do great. I hope he does. Then you got the guys whose glass broke, right? That no matter what he does, he can't get anything in that cup, that chalice. He can't get anything in there to say anything good. Now, what Kalen DeBoer has done is he shut him the hell up. He has shut him up. He's went Ryan Williams transfers. Oh, is he going to get a big name transfer? We don't have a hello, Keon Saab. You know what I mean? Yeah, Auburn's killing us. Hello, Antonio Coleman flip. Are we going to get a national? Hello, Derek Smith. So he's checking boxes. And, hey, they're still, you know, for everybody celebrating the touchdown, you're still at the 35-yard line. You know, we, we got a ways to go on this football field race to national signing day. But I do think the Alabama fans have a have a right to be excited, the ones that stood behind him. But there's a lot of recruiting left. And, you know, right now they're just basically dating. You got to get them, to, you got to get them down the aisle in December. But I think they've checked the boxes. Yeah, I, I think it was a surprise to maybe those who subscribe to that lazy narrative that sort of paralleled uh, DeBoer with like Brian Harson. I mean, Brian Harson didn't bring know. any type of infrastructure with him to Auburn. When I saw Courtney Morgan get off the plane with Kalen DeBoer yes, on Friday. and his wife and kids. I said, yeah. well, I don't know. And you're right. We still didn't know. And we still got a ways to go. But at least initially that told me, okay, this guy gets it when it comes yeah. to personnel and the importance of infrastructure and also the retention of a couple of key guys like Roach and Gillespie. 
you know, the, the short-sighted people, I don't think they even looked at the NFL draft. You know what I mean? If he didn't, I mean, if he didn't have two, three, four guys projected in the top 50 picks or whatever, at least two's in the first round. Is it three? It might be three, right? Two or three in the first round, three to five in that top 50 range pick, probably, you know, seven or eight in the top 100. That tells you alone he knows how to get talent on campus. That right out of the gate tells you he knows how to get players on campus and um, guys that can play football. Uh, right away. I've enjoyed what they do because you, they're very consistent in their work ethic. And you can tell because at night when Andrew Bone, Joseph Hastings and I are doing whatever we do, me watching TV like an old man, uh, you know, Andrew Bone doing worse than me and Joseph probably riding his bike around and w- with a helmet with a big light on the front. But that's when there's like six or seven offers come out that night. Because you know why? They're calling the kids at night. They're hitting the phone. So they're coaching all day. That's for now. I'm not saying, oh, my God, they reinvented recruiting. No, no, no. Other staffs do that. But Alabama is really recruiting. They're really evaluating. And one of the things I find really, really good is that when they when they offer a kid, I don't run to the database and form my opinion. Oh, my God, he's a three star. This guy sucks. I go and watch the guy. And I haven't really seen a lot of guys that aren't somebody you'd be impressed with or aren't somebody Nick Saban would take a look at. There's going to be guys like Zamir Smith. I get the Bama staff. Nick Saban staff probably wouldn't offer a guy like that. You know, we say that, but Javier Arenas and uh, Cyrus, there's been guys at that size, not as thin, but this is a different kind of system. So there's going to be system fits you see different, but the effort's there. And I don't know you know, what else you could ask for? I mean, it's the SEC. It's not nearly as bad as the, you know, I think the I think the rival fans being so negative have them concerned. And I agree with the, the guy just made a comment. I mean, if LeBron James leaves California and goes to the Hawks, I don't think he's going to suck because he's from the West Coast. I don't understand what the West Coast, you can't tie Harzen to Kalen DeBoer. I mean, if Lincoln Riley left, he's in the West Coast, right? If Lincoln Riley left and went to Florida, would you say he sucks because he's from the same area Brian Harzen in? It was just lazy and simple. I think it goes back to the Biggie Tupac thing, Tim, myself. You know, the East Coast, West Coast. That didn't end well for anybody. No. I'll say this, too, and I want to ask you about this. How much of this is secondhand saving? That's what I'm going to I'm going to trademark that. Instead of secondhand smoke, Tim Watts. (laughs) I don't know if that's a good idea. Secondhand Saban. That's got a lot of what are we what are we experiencing on that front with this success on the recruiting track? I mean, it's gotta help. And you, 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 we're, and, and we're gonna talk free agency in a minute, too. Boy, you, you talk about something that's beneficial to Kalen DeBoer jumping in that spot. How about the last couple of days of contract numbers and things like that? And yeah, these are guys that played in the Saban era, but it all counts. It all goes in Absolutely. the same stew, you know? Yeah. I had friends of Bam. I'm like, what the hell? Are you? So take me to John Wooden. You see how good all. I'm But the thing about this, like, yeah, I'm not going to take anything. But a lot of these guys are got like. I did not leave there. So a lot of people haven't been for Auburn. Uh, Zamir Smith is a brand new player. Was a prospect not connected to Nick and staff. Keon Saab is a guy not connected to Nick, uh, uh, Nick Saban's staff. And if you just look at all the West Coast offers, uh, Jackson Lloyd, who Charles Power moved to top 25, I think, to top 30 in the country. He's you look at Josiah Sharma, the big dancing bear out in the West Coast. He's another one. So they're definitely carving their own footprints here. I don't know. Is it carving your own footprints? Yeah. I don't know what. Okay. They're, they're, uh, they're, they're, yeah. They're, they're blazing they're their own trail like here. That. And it comes in handy to have a lot of these kids. Like you look in Juju Smith's profile, and he's been to Alabama four or five times before Kalen DeBoer. So that's definitely Alabama and how much, how well they recruited that plays a factor. But they're also out of that deep South area. So that's they're 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 doing they're handling their own business as well. Uh, let's talk about uh, NFL free agency involving former Alabama players. Again, been a very lucrative few days. I don't know if I had Landon Dickerson at the top of my 
biggest winner, perhaps, of this free agency period, but the big man, he got paid. And we talk about these numbers. And in the NFL, as you know, really what matters most is the guaranteed money. I mean, you, you see, I, the, the numbers are impressive. And you look at $84 million, I think it is, for Landon Dickerson to re-sign with the Eagles. But, man, it's that. It's that fifty million that's guaranteed that stands out, and he wasn't the only one. Look at Calvin Ridley, Dude, Calvin. Uh, big few days. Calvin's agents represent me in my next negotiation. That dude, they, they played my boys. They played good my boys. Him. I mean, man. four year, fifty million dollars guaranteed at the age of twenty nine, when everybody is shying away, starting to back off of those guys. You see that, but to get a four year, ninety two million dollar guaranteed contract, huge for him especially considering he missed time with Gant. I still haven't understood the gambling suspension. You know, I still haven't understood, like, the bet in a parlay. I still haven't understood that whole thing. But he's going to get that money back, obviously. I did find, you know, Twitter's been really good this week. I think Twitter's better when there's no sports or politics to talk about because the number of people saying Calvin bet on himself with, with his contract was amazing. And then they had all the gifts of, People bet somebody just bet 10 million that Calvin was going to the Jaguars. Oh man. So they had some they had some good stuff. But yeah, huge news. I love Derrick Henry going to the Ravens. Uh I'm not a Ravens fan, but I've always with Ozzy there, I've always kind of, you know, watched them. They've had plenty of Bama guys. I always kind of root for them. I enjoy watching Lamar at quarterback. But to get Derrick and Lamar in the same backfield, I mean, that's you know, that's tremendous. So yeah, it's been a good week, right? Is there any bad news? Uh, not really, not Bradley, really. Other, we'll get into my Jags getting played a little bit. Uh, and as you said, I, I got no problem with it from C-Rid's perspective because the CBA for the NFL PA has got to be the worst in the big yeah. three of professional sports. And so these guys, absolutely, when they got the hammer – they have got to swing it mightily. And we'll get into some more of that. I'll tell you real quick, one thing to watch to me, I found super interesting. No one's even really mentioned is Irv Smith went to the Chiefs. Yeah. Irv yeah. Smith to the Chiefs. I mean, he's kind of a Chiefs tight end, right? I mean, he, that's kind of his skill set. Tight end is such a crazy position. You see, guys, he was a second round pick, and we've seen so many third, fourth, and fifth round picks become Hall of Famers, basically. But Irv's got a chance to, to put up some numbers there, right? He Travis does. Travis. I mean, obviously, you got tra Travis Kelsey. Yeah, but he's going to be up to you. You can't travel. You can't go to Taylor's concerts every concert, practice in the NFL, do your podcast, and not get tired legs. Yeah. yeah. Irv's got a chance. To no, I like that for Irv. I mean, how I could do. you not? I think it's good. Ain't a good environment yeah. for him, too. You yeah. know, that'll be fun. Josh Jacobs, Xavier McKinney to the Packers oh, together. Love. You've got Mac yeah. Wilson, Jonah Williams to the Cardinals together yeah. so you got some of these guys pairing up too. a couple of yeah. new colts well i guess uh, ronnie harrison he had been yeah. with how the about, colts and now raekwon how about Jalen getting saquon barkley another friggin pretty amazing backfield i was secretly hoping that derrick henry might end up at philadelphia i just thought that would be uh that would be pretty fitting there him and Jalen in the backfield they were, all the bama guys they've got on that team but saquon barkley's a big one but yeah there's a lot of names a lot of activity. Boy, the NFL is a ruthless, ruthless business. I mean, it's – you got a guaranteed contract, five-year guaranteed contract, two seasons ago, and you're just cut. <laughs> yeah, you know I mean? look, like, that Saquon uh, deal with uh, the Eagles, that, that also speaks to Landon Dickerson's value in that offense because love Jalen. They do have weapons, obviously, in Devontae and A.J. and those guys at the receiver positions. But they want to be physical, and first and foremost, they want to run the football. And Landon's a very good one-on-one -on -one guy in pass protection, too. So it's not just about road grading. But uh, you start thinking about that run game in Philly with Landon and Saquon coming in there. It's pretty, uh, pretty interesting to consider. For sure. Tim, let's talk Alabama men's basketball as the Crimson Tide heads back to Nashville in search of another – SEC tournament championship. The road won't be easy. I was looking at the brackets, so though. I don't, I don't know how much it matters if you're on the Tennessee side. Alabama's 0-2 against the balls this season. Uh Kentucky obviously wouldn't be easy down the road. Uh, you think about the potential again for the rubber game 
tomorrow night with the Florida Gators. That to me is also a tough matchup because Florida has the kind of guards both on the offensive and defensive ends that you need against this Alabama team. And then they have the size in the post. So your initial thoughts as we get ready for another SEC tournament. You know, I think Trelly being back is absolutely massive. I think that I'm not sure they I don't think they win that Arkansas game the other day. Obviously, some 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 tired legs and some, you know, we're not going to win the championship. And, you know, they were going to be two or three seed either way, right? I think that's how it played out. I can't, I know, I know when they were locked into two or three. Uh, just not a great game, but they found it at the end. Small crowd, spring break. That's always a rough game. You don't want to be playing for anything in that last game. And I've always thought you really don't want to be at home because I think it's better to be on the road with their half crowd than your half crowd, you know? So, uh, a big win, but I think Trelly changes it. Florida, you know, Alabama's a competitor. There's nobody Alabama can't compete with that they're going to play, including Tennessee on a neutral floor. Tennessee is a better basketball team. I think we've seen that. They are the best team in the SEC. Kentucky is the most talented basketball team in the SEC and got a little bit of a heater going on uh, to, to, to some degree to make a run here to get to that two spot. So there's no, there was no scenario – that I could have seen that you get an easy cakewalk to the championship game, no. right? There just wasn't. I mean, you've got – what do we have? Mississippi State playing right now. I mean, this is are they playing right this moment? Are they playing soon, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the games today are kind of like, I think, all day. But I, I, yeah, don't, I don't have it on as of yet. So you got Mississippi State and LSU. Mississippi State, I think, still in contention for an NCAA trip. you got South Carolina playing today. you got Texas A&M, who's a very good team. And you got Florida playing today. So you've got four possible NCAA teams playing on the second day of this tournament. Some good basketball uh, to be played. So there was no easy way to win. I mean, this is this is going to be as tough as winning the Sweet Six, winning the national championship. Basically, you're starting at the Sweet 16 if you catch Florida first, right? Yeah. You don't have to go, you know, you don't have to go through. You don't have to go through some people. Or would that be Elite Eight? Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. No, that would be sixteen because you okay. know when you go to the well, no, it would be the it would be the yeah. So you're the basically eight. starting the SEC tournament State for Bama. Starting in the eight, yeah, yeah. So if it's Florida, it's don't ask me to do math, man. I, math is you know not better true. than that, Tim. How Someone long has to do math this? besides me. You know this. Yeah. I'm terrible at math, so but it, it it is. It's tough, and so even if you were on the top side of this bracket with Tennessee, you could be looking at South Carolina in a quarterfinal yeah, game, and I know yeah. Alabama hammered. But South Carolina earlier in the season, but that's still not a, a an easy that's, route. That for was Auburn that was the ex, that was the exception to South Carolina season, not the rule. They were very competitive, well coached. Andrew's um, got a straight. Thank you, down. Andrew. I don't Mississippi know how I State, was, LSU. I don't know why I thought it was this early. Yeah. I actually thought it was ten a.m. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah. It's Thursday. I don't do time and <laughs> time or math or daylight savings on Thursday. But yeah, it's a it's a good um, challenge, and you lead into the SEC. I lead, lead into the NCAA tournament. I mean, there's always a relief that you're in, right? Yeah, you're in the NCAA tournament. We've seen, yeah, we've seen, and other teams feel that way too. So there's not the same intensity for Florida and Tennessee. They could be a, you know, they're still playing for a high seed. Kentucky's still an extremely talented team, but you know. He's a lot of talk it. right now, Alabama four seed going into this thing. Not He's bad. Kind of, I'm, yeah, not at all. And you but I'm more from, of a draw guy. Until I know the draw, I don't oh, really yeah. care about seeding. I mean, you've seen teams in the seventh seed where you're like, dang, that's nice. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you don't know who you're getting. You can get the worst. You, know, you can be a one seed and get the worst. You know, your eight, nine can be a, you know. You can be a seven and you get a two in the second round that is far more compatible to Before your chances of run, advancing. And if before you're a four, run, yeah, before this Kentucky yeah. run, and you, you get a five get, that you don't match up with. Yeah. You could be a one C playing Kentucky in the second round. You know, yeah. I mean, they had to put this run on to give, you know, higher seed. But yeah, eight and nine is where the underachievers live. They I think well Tennessee, there. I think Tennessee, as you said, is the best team in this tournament. But I don't know if there's a team playing better or hotter right now than Kentucky, you know, and yeah, maybe yeah. the most talented team. Yeah. In Kentucky. To go into, to go going into Knoxville, yeah, and you can say, "Well, Tennessee already had it wrapped up." No. All that, no, no, no. no that's no, senior no. day. That's on your home floor. You're yeah. trying to play your best ball late. That that's, that wasn't a that wasn't a load iron, management game. That's their yeah. Iron Bowl. I mean, Kentucky yeah. just outplayed Rivalry. Tennessee. 
yeah, it's a rivalry. You want to no point. You want to be because I I wondered about that myself. Kentucky controlled the whole game too, so yeah, dangerous team. Um, and you should be when you have so many five stars and you know lottery picks and first round picks. You should be dangerous. Hey Tim, we're still a little bit of a ways out as we shift back to Alabama football, uh, but the potential for some A day stars coming up on April. The 13th. Do you have some guys in mind already? Uh, We'll talk about some of this in the mailbag too, but just guys that you could see in that sort of setting really shining on a day. Yeah, I think you're going to see one of the backup quarterbacks amaze us. I think you're going to have one give us the hope to carry on that. Will it be Dylan? Will it be Austin? Would it be Simpson? I think one of them are going to have a big game. Um, I think it's going to give be good enough to carry the the quarterback debate through the summer because um, okay. they're going to have opportunities there. I'm not sure which one. I think Austin, everybody's going to fall in love with Austin just because he's a cyborg. You know, I think you see him. You know, we had that question on the round table. Who would you have getting off the bus first? And I said your guy, Jaden Roberts, of course. But I also said I'm not opposed to having Austin Mack get off the bus and say, hello, I'm 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 a quarterback at the University of Alabama. Because they're going to think, what the what the hell? I think he's Wimby. think he's yeah. Wimby they're going like, whoa, wait, getting off yeah, the bus. Yeah, wait a minute. So I think he has a chance because we all, you know, we're all anxious to see him. But guys that are going to shine, I think Jeremy Bernard, um, Josh Cuevas. I think that's two guys that are familiar with this offense that have a chance to come in and shine right away. Um, so they're going to have that advantage, and you know, also a chance to see them for the first time. But usually, it's the shiny guy. It's the new guy. You know, it's. You know, for me, I'm always going to go Quay Russo and Jeremy Bernard right now. But uh, Dominic, you know, Jackson, he's a he's a guy. Uh, Keon Saab, you know, like I told you, you know, on our show on Monday, I feel like a traitor. I feel like I've like sold my high school recruits out because I'm all into these uh, transfer guys I've got to see. Because usually I'm so anxious to see the freshmen. But, you know, obviously, you know, Jalen Mbakwe has got a chance. We're hearing a lot about Red Morgan, right? Yeah. Running with the ones, you know, people that's not just, hey, let's just have fun with it. You know, we heard this. We I heard think that four, two, five is perfect for him. And we heard this with Malachi, although it was in the, uh, you know, it was in August. We started hearing Malachi's name running with the ones since he wasn't here in the spring. But we kind of get that same vibe you do with Red Morgan. So uh, I know I picked way too many. But, yeah, there's a lot there I'm looking forward to. There's guys you expect to shine. On A Day, and then there's the guys you hope will shine, right? Yeah, on A Day, and that starts at offensive tackle. I need to see Elijah Pritchett improve. I need yeah. to see it from Wilkin Formby. Hell, Nicole Bertrand coming in as the transfer, maybe is Overton. that guy. Overton. Well, I'm, that's on the defensive side. I'm talking about oh, I'm sorry. I'm offensive tackle. Yeah, me though, yeah, Overton is a guy I expect to shine for kind of the other reason. Yeah. And your guy Quay Rousseau, like if yeah. Quay Rousseau wrecks the A Day game, it, it's a little bit short sighted maybe to get excited about that because oh, yeah. you sort of expect him to already be that good of a player moving forward. It yeah. might just reinforce that you, you, you're looking to the the portal at offensive tackle. But yeah, I mean, you, you think about the wide receiver position too. You know, if we're talking about this strong of a quarterback room, which I think we are, starting with Jalen moving on to Ty, my guy Dylan Lonergan, uh, Austin Mack, you know, some of those receivers ought to have a big game. Guys like Jalen Hale, uh, you mentioned Bernard. I'm excited, and I know you're not going to put it all out there in an eight day game. How is Kendrick Law utilized? Yeah, um, he's going to be utilized. I don't have any doubt about that. But but how and then. You know, the running backs, too. Justice Haynes taking that next step. I, I guess for me, it's more about the offensive side because that's what I'm expecting to get from Kalen DeBoer and this staff. Yeah, I agree. And one thing that I think, you know, how, how close will he keep it to the vest? I don't think it's going to be as close as we expect. It could be, but I think – I think maybe he's your neighbor that got the Corvette that wants to rev it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I think he wants to show off what he can do. I mean, you know, I think he's the guy that – you know, hit the weights all winter. Got the restored '68 Camaro. Yeah. yeah, I think. Yeah, I think he wants to. Rah, 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 you know, yeah. like Frank, Frank in old school. I think he wants to show it off a little. Now we might not get a lot of it, but I think we're going to get a taste of what we do because he's not going to come here and run bananas 
you know, vanilla banana offense and then have everybody griping for the next four months that he don't know what he's going to do. Um, also, there's so much talent. I can't, I can only see it so plain. I want to see Connor Talty make some kicks too, yeah. by the way. I want to see, you know what I want to see? I want to see the center. I want to see Brock Meyer. I want to see Parker. Is I that a see... legitimate competition? Brock yeah, Meyer wanted... and Brailsford. It's being billed that way by Coach Cap. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot to see in so many freshmen. I mean, we could run down the list and, you know, Jalen Mbakwe and, you know, Mince. There's so many guys, Mince, so many guys we can mention. Monty Jackson um, needs to be one of those guys. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, if you look up your question in your secondary, if Damani's a guy and Red's a guy this early, you know, you, you to go on with Malachi and Sab. Yeah. All of a sudden, yeah. There. Yeah, all yeah. of a sudden you're, you're kind of filling in what you want to do. And if you get those guys up there, you got some experience, you got some, some so, some rawness there. I mean, you got three guys with experience and a freshman. You get those other guys behind them getting better, and yeah. Andrew King says he's rooting for Ty Simpson. He's from a town about two hours away from me. Kind of, kind of takes me back to oh, brother, where art thou? This town <laughs> is a geographical oddity. I think is what a wild, insane movie. Whatever it. I did not think I'd like it, and I loved it. So it, the dialogue yeah. is. The dialogue in that movie just is almost peerless. And the acting is amazing. Oh, and, I mean, we, had, detail. Just we got our dude it. from we got our dude from Rounders in there acting like, you know what I mean? Like an uneducated that friend. don't make no sense. And he is a friend that he's great at everything he does. I'm drawing a blank on his name, but my John dude Turturro? Is, yes. Is Turturro? Yeah. Yeah, he's amazing. He's amazing at everything he does. Yeah. But yeah. Ty's got a beautiful throw in motion. I see that in the videos we got. And, um, you know, I'm interested. I just want to see these guys go at it. And I think there's going to be a lot of excitement. I hope the fans turn out well. I might drag my butt up there for it. Uh, Slipping Jimmy, let's go to the roundtable mailbag, Tim. Mm -hmm. uh, Slipping Jimmy, he typically gets us going, and we appreciate that, Jim. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, discuss who you guys are hoping the Jags and Saints target in round one. What do you got for your Saints, Tim? Man, they need um, – I really was hoping that J, uh, Jaden Daniels was not going to leapfrog like he did. I was really hoping he was a match for the Saints in the middle of the first round. Obviously, they've jacked the quarterback position up pretty good. I'm not I'm not as big a car fan. But, you know, I go by Dane Bugler, who I consider one of the best, and he has in that range, that mid middle pick, he's got – Dallas Turner. If Dallas Turner's available, I will go to the draft, jump the jump over the counter, slug security, and walk up to that podium and say, the Saints take Dallas Turner. I feel the same about Brian Thomas, because if you can get him on the other side of Chris Olave, it would be amazing because they need some weapons. And also, I'm not opposed to, you know, uh, Brock, you know, the Georgia tight end. I'm not opposed at all there. Yeah. yeah. They need they need playmakers. They need I mean, they're paying the quarterback $25, 30000000 million. Um, they got a half of a young team and half of an old team, you know. So I would take any of those guys, a wide receiver. Dallas Turner would be a gift at 14, and he'd only there because quarterback and wide receiver is so insane in this quarterback wide receiver league. But to me, he's the best defensive prospect out there. Jimmy, as for my Jags, I'm kind of, kind of down bad after what C. Ridd did to my club yesterday and signing not only with another team, but the damn Titans on top of that. Kudos to his representation. Kudos, as I said earlier, to Calvin. Get yo money. And he got it. Yeah, uh, he got now it. the Jags are a receiver down. And I know they went out in free agency, brought in one. Uh, Gabe Jackson, I believe it is. Gabe, uh, maybe I've got that wrong. From uh, the Bills. Uh, I think they no, still Gabriel, need him. they got Gabriel Davis, right? Davis, yeah. Yeah, Gabe Davis. Davis. He's, he's nice. Yeah. He's a nice he's player, nice. but they need a legit outside dude because a couple of years ago they paid way too much for Christian Kirk, not a true number one. Um so where do they go from here? And and I hear you on Davis. I think he can be a, a welcomed and and helpful. You know who I'd like addition. to see the Jags interested drafting that low. Um, 17. McConkey. I wonder if they look at Lad. I've, I've seen McConkey in Jaguar circles, maybe AD Mitchell, Adon A. Mitchell from Texas. They, they, how about Xavier Worthy? Now, these guys aren't all projected in the first, but 
There's a lot of receivers this year. Yeah, that's the thing. When you get past like that, Brian Thomas, I think that's the fourth receiver. Does that sound? Yeah, that sounds right. I think he's the fourth receiver. After you get past that, you're into the. Do you want Worthy? Do you want you know? Do you want? See, I'm not sure Thomas, and I and I love his measurables and his size and all those things. Tim, I'm not sure he's a big time number one. Now he may be, but I could see him being T Higgins. You know, and that's not bad. No, he was no, no, no. He was the early second. I don't know how, if you're a team that's pretty well stocked up, how you don't take a shot on Xavier Worthy. Well, that speed, I mean. 14. I mean, I mean, they're sitting here. We're talking about his size. They need again. that kind of guy, too. They, they don't did, they can't stretch the field. We talked about size till you know, Smitty luckily had people that loved him. He had the Giants and the Eagles that were fist fighting over him. But we had people worried about his size, Deshaun Jackson. I mean, the NFL's I would, not I wouldn't mind seeing J.C. Latham in Jacksonville, but it would oh. probably be that he's moving inside. Um, yeah. And I don't think they're going to – They're going to go. Yeah. I don't think they're going to – I don't think they're going to go interior OL probably at that point. But, yeah, so that's kind of the way it looks right now. Uh, Bama 22-12 with research opportunity for us. Who is the oldest or eldest, as he says, Bama player in the NFL – Right now, I got to think about that one a little bit, Tim. Is it's not Derek yet, is it? I guess I need to think, think so. back to like 2010, 2011, 2012. Eddie Jackson, but that's more 2015, 2016. Um, I can get us some in Cam Robinson's been in the league for a while now, you know, yeah. six, seven, eight years. They go through quick. They go through very quickly. There's got to be a guy we're just sitting on. It's. I mean, I feel like it's Calvin Ridley. Even though, it might be Rid. Well, he's only 29, but I mean, I feel he's like Calvin. There. I feel like Calvin has been. Uh, Derek's up there. I mean, Derek. He, he went into the league Scott. in 16. How, J.K. Scott. He's been around a while. J.K. went. I think, and he might have went in 18. Shoot, Cam Robinson's only 28? Yeah. How the hell yeah, is that possible? He's he been went in the league. In, he went in in 17, I think. Yeah, yeah. Derek same. went after the 2015 season, won the Heisman, won the national championship, went to the Titans. C.J. Mosley, how old C.J.? That might be the answer right CJ, there. C.J.'s cut a rug out there. C.J. So CJ went in in 2014. So, yeah, so he he's be, a 10-year I, guy. So High Towers retired. High Towers retired. Julio, Julio, shoot. Yeah, Julio would be the guy. Julio's thirty-five. I'm looking. If at he's him still now. at, if he's still going to catch on somewhere, I mean, I he's at the end right. of it, obviously. But he, through last season, if you use that as sort of the measuring well, stick, there's also Kareem Jackson. Kareem too, and Kareem. I know he's around because he keeps getting suspended. <laughs> Kareem, you remember? Wow. Kareem went out early. And Nick didn't like it. Remember yeah, that? Kareem is, left, I, I think, after that 09 season. So it would it would be Kareem. So Kareem to flashback, he was kind of that out of the blue defensive back out of Nick Saban and them took. You remember in his first full yeah. class, I think. Yeah. Um, and Perhaps he went cool. into the NFL. This is how good his career's been with Andre Smith, Glenn Coffey. Um, Rashad Johnson, who might still be in the NFL, Rolando McLean and Javier Arenas. That's how old Kareem Jackson is. So what a career that that he's absolutely he's had. It's of course rather amazing. Nick was Nick was not happy because the, the belief was Kareem was not going to be a first round guy. And then he was, you know, so uh he kind of left, I want to say, without Nick's complete blessing i don't you know I, I think nick certainly was complimentary of him but just in terms of the decision at the time uh and it worked out pretty well for kareem jackson so there you go um also bama 22 12 i don't know if he has jokes or what he says wonder what happened to the bowls trio tim that signed with alabama in the late 80s hope they are we well have- any I background have- stories to tell you've got a good your favorite chris ryer story is the yearbook. Chris's yearbook photo had all <laughs> eyes on me on him, which is the most rare crap I've ever heard. You got to understand life. the bowl school is about as prestigious as it gets. 
What did and, you tell me about the cereal that time that had me rolling? Oh, they I'm had dead. different cereal. He's like, dude, we have different cereals in the morning. We got like different. Yeah, like the, the cantina how, at bowls. They got like six different cereals. Yeah, that had, they had me have, rolling. They don't just have frosted school. flakes. Yeah, yeah, we got that's it. We had one. Yeah, um, they're we all like, well, Bama 2212. Um, they're doing great. Sam Matthews uh, has got his own construction business, as I re- understand it. Uh, Chris has worked for the Jags for 15 plus seasons now. The Jacksonville Jaguars, he now pretty much runs their video department uh, in the NFL. Uh, and Travis Carroll, he actually ended up playing a little bit in the NFL. Travis doing fine, from what I understand. I know they. Chris did it. not cost, did not lose Calvin Ridley for the record. No, he did not. He did not. I don't think he was willing to take a pay cut to keep Calvin, but no, no, that one doesn't go. A lot. You can blame Chris for a lot. Trust me. Just not that, that one, not, not so much. Tide Hashira checking in here. How have the tight ends been doing? They've been the quietest group this year so far. Well, we're what three practices in Tim. Yeah. And uh, when I was out there for the Wednesday media viewing period, it looked like CJ Dupree was non-contact, which it was a non-contact practice anyway, but he looked to be working off to the side. So maybe he's working through something right now, but as a group, I mean, there should be considerable excitement about the potential of those guys. Even if Caleb Odom sticks with the wide receivers. Now I had a, guy who watched every practice mentioned uh, Josh Cuevas to me out of the mm-hmm. blue. And that's always the best little nugget you can get is when you're not asking. You know, you ask, yeah. yeah. When you ask, and that's, you know, that's usually like the time the uh, Amari Cooper was at the Alabama camp and all the defensive coaches were going, dude, there's a guy here named Amari Cooper killing us because offensive coaches are going to brag on their own. But yeah, to get that unsolicited, you know, the thing with, with, with Caleb is kind of funny is like, we always – I called him a flex tight end, right, which means he's going to line up, you know, in the slot, out wide, in the backfield. On the, he's not an in line. He never was a tight end. That's why they got Jay Lindsey. He, was, he wasn't He was really – and Jay's kind of the mixture, much more like C.J. Dupree. Caleb was always kind of like that Mike Williams, if you go back to the USC days, maybe even Keyshawn Johnson. Not a 4-4 guy, but extremely long, tall – playmaker, got good speed, especially when his legs unwind. So there's a lot of surprise. I think the whole title with him just doesn't really matter. You know what I mean? I still consider him a tight end. I know he's out there with the wide receivers, but I mean, I think that he was recruited as a tight end, but it was never the end line. He was never going to line up at the end of the line and block. He was always going to be basically lined up at wide receiver. And he's different than all the other wide receivers. There's, you know, he's he's taller, you know, he's longer, he's got a lot going on. But the excitement around him, I mean, when you're getting your peers uh, talking about you in the way they do, I mean, there's not much higher compliment. I know because Travis and Andrew and all of them are always bragging about how good I am. So uh-huh. I can't. Exactly. Me and, Kate, me and Caleb have things in common here. Uh-huh. Uh, let's talk about Stu underscore Hart here in the roundtable mailbag. Uh, any clue on the format for A Day? Will we get another Mike Price style ones versus two, or a ones versus one? I hope we get a continuation. I don't know of anything at this point solid in that regard. I would think you'll get, uh, you know, at least ones versus two. I hope the thing I liked about Saban spring games, at least for a quarter or two, you got good on good. You got ones versus ones, yeah. and it was obviously done offense, defense, and broken down that way. What do you like, Tim? I like the ones-on-ones, at least a couple of series. I have no idea for the record what they're going to do. I don't think Charlie Potter does. He'd be the one that probably would know the the yep. plan. And it, it might not have been decided yet. Again, this is his coaching staff who's seeing their team in pass for the first time, so they're getting to know them. And I think they want to put them in situations – to challenge them, you know, so I know that if they know who their ones are, but then again, you want to see how good Red Morgan is. You want to see where he's at. You sling him in there versus the one. So I expect to see, same for Damani Jackson and Keon Saab, same for the the offensive, you know, the centers and the, the offensive tackles. I think you'll see one-on-ones, but, I mean, it's just a speculated guess at this point. Yeah, I almost hope we still uh, keep Nick Saban as sort of the spring game commissioner too, Tim. Maybe still put him out there. You know, I'd like for field. him to hold a mic and call the game. Is what if I'd you're like. ESPN and you're showing this thing on ESPN, 
which I got to think it's not just that it's Kalen DeBoer's first spring game. You got to think Nick Saban works for ESPN, right? Yeah. Nick Saban's going to be involved in this thing. I just so put him out there, able- put him out there on the field, mic'd up, and let him work it from that angle. That's where I what want to Nick Saban. It's going to be really hard for him not to say something during that game. You know uh, that's what I mean? Why I want, but that's why I want to. No, I mean, there. I don't know. I mean, like, hey, watch your footwork. You got to yeah. jam him inside. I feel coaching. like, has he it's ever a totally been a, different concept and scheme. Has he ever been a football coach between the hashes? Why are these the DBs sideline? looking back at the quarterback pre snap? I mean, I think when he used to go to high school games, he had feedback during the game to the guys yeah. who weren't even going to college. If I'm you ESPN, know? man, I'm maximizing. Oh, absolutely. If I'm Nick Saban, I'm, I, I, knowing my personality, I would never not be able to say anything. Yeah, I'm pretty yep. sure it'd be hard for him to bite his tongue when they did it wrong. Oh. He would do it, though. I think he oh, yeah, do I it. want that spont- spontaneity. I would love to have him out there in a pink, you know, a pink uh, blazer running that's, thing. Uh, I think Nick might tell you that's salmon. That's salmon, Tim, not pink. But well, in alabaster, it's the same. South Florida, it's pella. Yeah, it's like a. Uh, yeah, and South Florida is different. Oral South Florida look. Uh, JP1412 here in the mailbag, Tim. Which quarterback has a better chance of flipping to Alabama, Juju, or Deuce when we talk about 2025 quarterback targets? You know, I think it's to be determined. I think they did a good job with both. I mean, you know, especially Juju coming back from multiple day visits and so familiar. I mean, with him being that high profile of a quarterback, He's going to be what all quarterbacks do now. NIL is going to factor in. We've seen that a lot with the top quarterbacks. No judgment pass. So I think that's going to factor into it. I mean, he's committed to USC, um, Georgia, Alabama. I mean, he's you know he's a guy that basically can call any school and commit. Um, he's one of those top three or four or five quarterbacks in the country. And again, as we went down this list to get a good quarterback, Bama's probably got to flip somebody because so many are committed. Mm-hmm. Me personally, I'm a Deuce guy. I mean, I like Juju. Don't get me wrong. But I like I like Deuce. I like that he's a little bit raw. I like what he brings to the table. I like that he's, you know, sometimes you get those kids from the, you know, the quiet areas and they're a little bit tougher and a little meaner. It reminds me kind of Derek Smith from Selma, who we really haven't heard, you know, his recruitment's been real quiet. You don't hear a lot about Deuce either. I mean, Juju's a, you know, a big deal. I mean, he travels with a, you know, an SID department, basically. He's got he's that's got age. That's who Kalen DeBoer visited first, right? When he took the job um, was Deuce. Gosh, he went in. I don't remember if he was first, but he was I remember it was early. I think it was. I think it was. I think Juju was visited by an assistant. Maybe boy, that a lot happened. And that seems yeah. like that seems like ten months ago, doesn't it? <laughs> That's crazy. But I think that right now the best chance would be. Um, it just depends how hard they want to go in on Juju. I think there's going to be a lot of a uh, lot of interest there. Um, I personally, I'm a Deuce Knight fan. If you're looking at between those two. Um, I like them both. I mean, you'd be happy with either of them, but I'm a deuce kind of guy watching this film, understands a little bit raw. And maybe it's the the left-handed gunslinger mentality after seeing Kalen DeBoer's offense ran by that similar guy. Michael Penix Jr. Yeah. Say it before I say it, Trent. Jamie say it. 14 12 also <laughs> asks, has the Jamie French boat totally sailed? Staff Boy, they are not advertising it. much. They love some Jamie. For, they, we've asked more questions about Jamie than Ryan, which is kind of amazing. I don't I don't know. I don't know. Jamie so far, if he doesn't come back on the visit, obviously, you know, Alabama's out of it. I mean, the Alabama staff likes him as a player and have reached out to him and all that stuff. Him and Ryan are close. He is where he we get asked about him four or five times um a week, probably at least. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Right now, I mean, you're you're trying to get him in for a visit. Obviously, the visits always determine how much, you know, obviously the visual of visiting would let you think they have a much better chance. I mean, without him visiting, no chance. But, you know, right now I haven't really heard a whole lot of his name. But Alabama does like him. I mean, they would obviously recruit him and trying to get him to visit and all the good stuff. Major Wood 482 here in the mailbag. What's the number one thing you guys will be looking forward to watching at the 8 day game, we went through that pretty extensively just a few minutes ago. But he also asked, what's the visitors list looking like for the spring game? Still a little too far out, Tim, to kind of project? Or are you already getting a, a pretty good feel of the I stars mean, that will be making their way to Tuscaloosa? Well, I think it's going to, you know, I think, I mean, well, yeah, it's too far out to narrow it down. I mean, we've got, 
you know, we had, I don't know, 25, 30 people come in on the 8th. I mean, you got a big visitors list coming up on the 23rd. Now, again, I mean, it, you know, you can, you can relate, you know, recruiting is a lot like dating. You get them there on campus once, that's the first date. You know, you get them, you go visit them, that's the second date. The third date is probably the 8 day game, right? And then, the, you know, you're trying to get them on an official visit. And you're, you know, it's all about getting to know each other, getting to know them. How do they like it? Some kids will love the campus. You know, always go back to Damian Harris, the running back. I think Nick had to get his luggage and drive him across the state line to get him to leave the University of Alabama. Some people love it, um, and some people don't. It's just going to come down to preference, opportunity, the relationship with the coaching staff, and all that stuff. So I think these – say a long way of saying, all these visits you're seeing in March are going towards trying to get them back for a day game. And also going to depend how many people are having a day game that day because that's going to be a heavy populated day of everybody trying to get them on campus. Right now it's been a little bit easier. Alabama had that week. There wasn't a lot of schools with that first week of spring uh, practice. Uh, LSU was one, and LSU had a massive amount. But now a lot of them are doing it. George and a lot of them have kicked it up. So when Bama comes back, they're going to have to really work to get some of these guys because that's you know that's part of the recruiting process is just recruiting to get an unofficial visit now. Crown and Soda here in the mailbag. Are you guys watching Shogun on FX? If, if it's on, Tim Watts is watching it. I can go ahead and tell you. It's possible, but Shogun, that's that's up my alley. That's my that's my kind of thing. I love movies set in Asia with action. Um, you know, how big I love the Korean shows. I'm watching one on Netflix now. Um the uh yeah, I love Shogun, the way it was set up. I mean, I'm familiar with the old the old show and um, all the history of it. So yeah, I've loved it. We're midway through it. It's good. It's very, uh, it's very like setting up to where we're going. A little bit of violence is happening now. So there's more on the way, but yes, absolutely. And I love it. I'm watching full swing on Netflix, the PGA tour. This disappoints me. I saw that last week. I didn't I know. know I'm behind you. I can't believe that. Well, I watched it all basically in a day. Yeah. Two you days. Binged it. I, it. I, I I love it. I don't know why, even without loving golf or sports, I can watch the documentaries and I'm amazed by it. I told you I was texting you feedback. Who's the flat bill guy? I, know, like? I was proud of you. Ricky. Yeah. I love Ricky. Ricky's a good dude. Um, you know, I think I he like comes off in a very good light, as you would expect. Gretzky's uh, daughter got on my nerves. She was which daughter? Gretzky's. Yeah, Paulina. Did she marry? Yeah, she she's can married be a to, lot. She's you know, married to who? Married to Dustin Johnson. Yes, that's which her. Is an interesting she was like, pairing there. She was in like all of a sudden she's like, "Can I walk this course?" And she was all in the like, like all right, oh move yeah, along. oh move yeah. Along. You Paulina, surely had your own reality show. This is his move supermodel. Along. Yes. Yeah. Um, I thought that, and I'm and I'm only about halfway through. I'm I'm not to the Ryder Cup yet, so. That was pretty cool. Uh, thought it was interesting stuff about Joel Damon, you know, kind of a journeyman player uh, and some of the struggles that even as of today, he's still going through after becoming Netflix famous following yeah. season one. Now I'm a golf hardcore, so I knew plenty about Joel Damon, yeah. but very revealing in the second season because that dude's working through some issues. Got a yeah. new baby, got a new house. I think he's feeling the pressure of paying the bills and staying relevant in terms of his golf game because he's not an elite player. I, I, I like those kind of stories. I like that sort of that sort of look uh, behind the scenes that you don't typically get. That was that was pretty interesting to me to this point. Um, yeah, I agree. Wobro also checking in here in the mailbag. Tim, what is your thermostat set at? at your home and also he says your hoodie game is strong so there you go well thank you we do 67 at night 70 in the day um my office which i'm in what do you do at, at night 67 okay yeah the kids are upstairs they're uh they're more so that's the heat's on 67 mm, the cold's on 67 too what oh wow. yeah oh yeah I mean, I get. I have to. I have to. I have to. I have to be cold. Not cold, but I chilly. like it cool. But sixty-seven on the it's AC yeah, for eight hours. It's not bad. Damn. They um, we. But my office is smaller, so it's often a lot of my hoodies are short sleeve though. Yeah. So the gun show. Um, 
But uh, yeah, the office is smaller, so it'll suck in a lot of heat, or it's usually hotter in here or colder in here. So I'm getting old, man. I used to be like you said, at least seventy on the thermostat, but I get colder now. You oh, know, I do I too. To, I used to stay hot. Now my old ass gets cold. No, that's so not. I can a, set it. I can set it on seventy four now. Yeah. You know, my my parents. We would go to their house five, six years ago, and you'd walk in, and they'd have, you know, how parent, you know, the older folks are, they'll have it on 78, you know, or something. And I'm like, what in the, world? and this is, you know, May or June. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't so keep it. I'm starting clear, to turn into them. We don't keep it at 67. We go to bed at 67. Okay. Um, during the day, it's, it's around 70 degrees. It's, yeah, it's comfortable. Nice but comfortable. I, hey, look, I'll tell you one thing I put pride aside. I don't really look at the thermometer anymore. I go by how I feel. If yeah. I'm cold, look, my wife's the queen to turn the air down and get under three blankets. I'm like, if you didn't get under three blankets, you wouldn't need to turn that air down. So really, I'm just going in my cold and my hot. I don't even I'm not I'm not doing that. But I, I did have a sense of pride about, you know, raising that heat up past 70. Text tighter in the mailbag. Our pal ask right. for individual picks to have a money year for Alabama that results in the biggest. 2025 draft boost guys in money years tim damani jackson's in a money year isn't he uh, third year guy uh, yeah no, so. well, yeah he is well so is jeremy bernard and keon Saab, right yeah all those guys are all those guys are in money years i'm gonna go with the wild card i'm gonna go with pritchett I'm going to go with Pritchett's going to raise his stock. That would be great for Alabama if that's the it case. It would. I still just think that the guy, they saw enough that he was a he was a starting left tackle at one point. You know, you can get in your head pretty quick. You have a bad game like he did in the A-Day game. You, you know, it's hard to recover from that. Maybe a new coach in his ear, a new kind of offense, figuring it out a little bit. Because, I mean, seriously, I mean, as beautiful as Jaden Roberts is off the bus, Pritchett's every bit – the look or look of a football player, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's got every bit of it uh, out there. So I go with my wild card. I think I think Pritchard is going to have is really going to push this year, and I might eat that later on. But I think that's a guy that they're gonna they're gonna try to make something out of. Give me one of those inside linebackers between Deontay yeah. Lawson and Jahad Campbell. How about that? If Deontay stays healthy, and I know that's the big if because each of the last three seasons. Sure. It's been a problem for him. I don't think in terms of projectability and, you know, other things, he he, he projects and, and holds up well. Uh, it's just a matter of can he stay on the field. I'd say Tim Smith, I think you've mentioned him too. Yeah. In this yeah. regard, uh, if I was going to go up front more so than a Tim Keenan or a Jaheim Otis, I would go Tim Smith because, I mean, it has to happen. This is it for him, man. This, this is the year – uh, that he needs to bar more or a boy be and we've seen that one of those guys yeah yeah, yeah. and i think yeah. it helps that we've seen defensive linemen get in there uh and again a new scheme right there's no you know he's coming in in a new scheme under kane womack still going to have the familiarity of his same defensive line coach so a lot of things work for him we know he's talented we see we see the flashes we've seen that so it's just putting it together and uh you know knocking it out but I'll be honest, this is like a super exciting time to be following Alabama right now. I mean, that's I've got the naysayers friends, and again, I use that way too much, thanks to Terry and Arnold. But the people, the doubters, even my friends that were like the most, and that's just their nature. They doubt everything, they doubt the steak's gonna be cooked right at Longhorn, you know. But they even they have got pretty excited about everything they're seeing. Um, and again, I think it goes back to when, you know, five years ago. What do you think is going to be like two months after Nick Saban retires? And most people were going to say death and famine and destruction. I hope a comet hits us. You know what I mean? I think they were, they were really a lot of people were at that murder pressure. ball. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I had I had doubts, but I don't think they could be in you know middle of middle of uh, March. I don't think they could be in a better spot right now. Uh, Bama Maverick, which leads us into what are you hoping to see in the 8A game? We've outlined, I think, a good bit of that. I'm I'm anxious to see the turnout, you know, other yeah. than what we've talked about on the field, Tim, just the numbers that you're going to have at Bryant-Denny Stadium for this one. Turn up, yeah, absolutely. I agree. I want to see – I want to see everything. I mean, it's hard for me to pinpoint down to one thing. I really want to see the, you know, the defense. You know, I really want to see the swarm. 
I really want to see Jalen Milrow and these quarterbacks in that offense, but I don't know. I think, you know, I could go on Justin Haynes, Justice Haynes. I want to see Justice Haynes get, you know, tote the mail, but I really want to see these wide receivers go to war out there. I want to see these wide receivers get some work, you know, Jalen Hill, Kobe. I mean, we know all the big names. I wish Ryan was out there. That That's, See, Ryan not coming is a blessing. That's almost too much to ask. <laughs> Visually, we couldn't – I don't think Bama fans could – I think they'd go blind if Ryan Williams was almost out there. It would just be oh, sensory overload on what to watch. Uh, nah here in the roundtable mailbag. Who is this year's Tim Keenan along the defensive line? Defensive lineman, Tim, that you could envision – taking another step where they've got some quality depth up there. It may be hard for someone outside of Damon Payne and uh, Keenan and Jaheim Otis. And, you know, a lot of these guys we saw a year ago stepping forward. I've got it. I've got a guy in mind though. I'll let you go first. I'm probably going to steal him because th- great minds think alike and all I'm going to go. I think I'm close. I'm going to go with Jordan Renaud. Okay. You went more with an end. That's cool. I'm gonna. I, I'm. Gonna, I like that pick. I. I think he's, uh, you know, very much got the the ability to take that step forward. They have some guys at that sort of position. I'm interested to see does uh, Keon Keeley kind of impact. Yes, that yes. situation with Jordan Renaud and mm-hmm. you know some of those other defensive ends to go along with Jamari and Latham and you know Edward the guys Hill's that they're guy. bringing back. Yeah, there's some guys. I mean, you know, when you saw some of the older guys, you know, hitting the portal, I mean, we kept hearing a lot about Jordan Renaud, who looks the part, and Edric Hill. They were getting really good reviews as youngsters um, on a very picky defensive line group. And, hey, you like you said, you've got some depth. You look at the – if you're a defensive line guy, this new system, they've got a lot of defensive linemen on that uh, on that team. They've got yeah. some depth, and that did not always seem to be the case at Alabama with the revolving coaches and a lot of the things that happened. Uh, I never felt the defensive. It's been a while since I felt the defensive line was deep. This deep anyways. I'll go Edric Hill. You know, again, I, I think Good. what you're thinking is, is that yeah. Otis and Keenan and Payne and those guys inside are going to be sort of your bell cows in that rotation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if we're talking about a second year guy, maybe more specifically, I'll go with, uh, I'll go Edric Hill, 6'3", about 295 pounds. Think he could yeah. uh, take another step in 2024. We've heard uh, a lot of good things about Hill. We've heard a lot of good yeah. – last year they were talking about, and he was behind some some pretty good uh, players and behind a different defensive line. So No doubt. Uh, Andrew MC, as we wrap up the roundtable mailbag here, who finishes the year with more total yards, he asked. Jeremy Bernard <laughs> – are Ryan Williams more total yards, which I'm guessing you're putting return Special yards team. in there too. You're not saying scrimmage yards, which is rushing, receiving, passing, I guess. You're talking total yards, Tim. Jeremy Bernard or Ryan Williams? You know, again, I feel like I'm cheating. I feel like my side of these portal people, you know, these the portal people. Portal I gotta people. go with I gotta go with Bernard. I mean, digging into what he they were expecting out of him at Washington last year, next year. Would have been he was wide receiver one, uh, very familiar with the scheme, which thinks I help. I mean, there's a lot of things. I'm not certainly not judging Ryan's talent. Everybody knows, you know, we think Ryan, the world of Ryan as a player, but Ryan's going to arrive in the summer. Jeremy's been in this system a few years, going to go through the spring, going to have that connection with Jalen Milrow, going to have that connection with every quarterback, knows Austin Mack from, you know, back at Washington. Um, and then Ryan's got to come in as a true freshman. A year ahead at 17 years old. Um, so I'll go with Jeremy for, for a multitude of reasons, but it's not going to shock me at all if Ryan gets behind the defense a few times and pads some stats. I think he's a he's definitely a a, a bona fide deep threat right out of the gate. For I mean, if he shows up for the first game, just and they say run fast deep, I think he'll catch a ball in that game. Yeah, I think it it has the potential to be very close, and that would, I think, be a good thing for Alabama because, as we've seen in this DeBoer offense as recently as Washington, there's room for a couple of 1,000-yard guys. Uh, that, sure. th- there's going to be opportunities there. Uh, I can see both ways. I can see where Bernard, because of his experience uh, and jumping right into this thing, is going to have an advantage. Very good talent, very good player in his own right. I think both of these guys are going to have – 
guys at their primary spots that are going to see time too. Uh, Kendrick Law is still going to see the field, even yeah. with Jeremy Bernard in there. Uh, Jalen Hale, I think, is still going to see the field, even with Ryan Williams coming in. But, yeah, I could see that one being close. I'll go Ryan Williams just because I think, as you outlined, the explosiveness in his game. Yeah. He may not need as many targets or touches to hit the yards number. And he's still a possibility in the return game too, right? I mean, yeah, absolutely. what do you think about that? Yeah, and I also don't think Ryan's going to be a guy at 17 with his build. You're going to be sending him across the middle a whole lot either. I think Bernard, you know, not out of the gate. I mean, he's got to get, you know, he's missing eight months of a, a strength and conditioning program and all that kind of stuff, and he's slight of build. Um, so I think Bernard's going to be more, have more of the route tree at his availability, which will increase his patches, passes. But again, Ryan is a, a catch and a cut away from scoring on almost any play, right? I mean, there's yeah. not a whole lot to, you know, this guy. And he also has a displayed, he's a route tree guy. You know, when you watch him in high school in the all-star games, there's nothing he's not not uh, capable of doing. He's very capable of going deep, going up the seam, you know, hitting the post, uh, across the middle, a short pass coming off a bubble screen or anything like that. He's displayed all of that. So, again, to me, it's just more age and experience is the difference. Um, because Ryan is, you know, Ryan's a, you know, Ryan's an unbelievable wide receiver prospect. And of course, a lot of this is going to go back to the quarterback position and yeah. how that it, sort of it, translates in this offense and the ability to get the ball out quickly on time and accurately. That's always yeah. the, uh, the common denominator when we talk about numbers for guys like Ryan Williams and Jeremy Bernard, Tim, it's been a lot of fun, man. That wraps yeah. up the, ma- the mailbag, the round table mailbag. Again, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, we certainly hope you'll do that. Hit the subscribe button right now. Hit the likes for us as well. Turn on those notifications. We greatly appreciate it. Anything else, Tim, before we get out of here? Don't forget Tennessee is in Alabama are playing this week to open the SEC baseball. Unbelievable. Unbelievable series to test yourself in the course of the SEC tournament. So, you know, you never know. There could be breaking news too. These were Any chance, to- Tony, you think Tony Vitello starts a fight between the teams? You know, I don't know Tennessee's what to make tipper. of that guy. I've seen baseball is trying to get more. Tony v- I see a lot more weird stuff in baseball now, like celebrating and out at second with the chest bump. And it's unreal, you know, man. I think they're it's, just uh, noticed because let's be impressive. honest. Yeah. Nobody really notices them unless they do stupid stuff in college. Well, baseball. I just don't, you know, I don't think anybody's is concerned anymore about getting a fastball in the ear hole, you know, like they used to be either. It's kind throw of you out now. Become accepted. You know, you hit a double, you slide into second, you and you do this sort of Danny Terrio move. They can call me Boomer up. all they want, but there was nothing better. Like I saw a highlight the other day of the guy in the batter's box stepped out on Pedro twice. And Pedro Martinez and Pedro went him. and Pedro went like, okay, okay, let's see if you like this, and then nailed this dude in his back. Well, Pedro like, and, and the guy Pedro, didn't charge Pedro or anything. He just kind of looked like, hey, next time I'm not going to step out, you know. Yeah, I mean, Pedro once said, "Dig up the babe, I'll drill him in his ass." Well, the thing about it is, <laughs> now it's easier to get hit because they're they're wearing, you know, they're wearing RoboCop gear. It's hard I to know. Even get. It's hard yeah. to get to a bump. Like they go to a Mako and get fenders put on before Randy they go to the plate. Pitching. Yeah, when Pedro and Randy Johnson in pitching the, the yeah. you know the Phillies would go down to Walmart and get helmets when they ran out. You know, it's the same. Yeah. It's the same yeah. ones me and you were using in little league. So, um, but yeah, baseball's here. It'll be fun. It's a good Alabama test softball with a couple of wins in a row. Now that was a big win at Florida State last night for Patrick Murphy. I know club. the social media. You see the social oh, media go to work. Oh, I love the pettiness. Yeah, they say, yeah, it. they yeah, you can't blame the committee for this. One. Ah, jeez. Yeah, I know a I know a guy doing a podcast having a fit about the softball <laughs> team right now. He's so mad. He's so mad about softball team. Mission accomplished. Then. Yeah, that's what that yeah. was all about. Oof. Um. Yeah. So Patrick Murphy's team, uh, lost two of three to Florida, but won the the third game of that series and then goes to Tallahassee, gets a win. We'll see if uh can pick things up on the conference front, but all of that and more right there with us at BamaOnline.com. Hang out with us on the round table, premium message board there with us at BOL. You got Tim Watts, you got Andrew Bone, 
You got Joseph Hastings. You got Jimmy Stein, the great Charlie Potter. Can't say that enough. The great Charlie Potter, uh, Clint Lamb as well. All of it waiting for you right now at BamaOnline.com. Enjoyed it, Tim. Enjoyed it. You guys like and subscribe, and we'll see you on the roundtable. Absolutely. For Tim Watts, Travis Ryer, thanking you again for joining us. Until next time, so long, everybody.